Okay, so welcome. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And my name is Janet Newsham, and I'm the chair of the Hazards Campaign and coordinator at Greater Manchester Hazards Centre. We're an occupational health and safety advice and campaigning organisation. Um, and uh, we're recording the event so that we can send out the link afterwards and any links to presentations or to other things. Okay, I'll just mute Ian. There's some more coming in. You just know as soon as you start, then everybody starts to join. <laughs> so it's the case. Okay. Uh, right. So this is uh, it's the inaugural World Ventilation Day Hazards Campaign Meeting. Uh, this day was created by academics uh, and engineers to raise awareness about uh, the importance of ventilation and that it's the crucial part of um, enabling health and well-being at work. Uh, it's a day dedicated to recognising uh, and promoting the importance of ventilation and indoor air quality. And I suppose COVID-19 has put uh, the spotlight on it, hasn't it? It's uh, in both ensuring that um, indoor air was virus free, but also uh, the negative impact that air, qual air quality has on us, all our health and our cognitive uh, functions, especially young children if you're in the, in the schools and uh, in childcare. We all know that uh, pre-pandemic, that uh, the endless afternoon in the, in the office when people nodded off or, or um, existed on strong coffee and other sort of stimulants to, uh, to improve their concentration uh, and work at that time lapsed really, that work output lapsed or the endless colds and uh, coughs and other bugs that, um, that did the rounds really in the offices. So, you know, it's really important is ventilation. And I think we've, we've seen that, um, especially over the last two and a half years. We have limited legislation on ventilation, which could have been used to ensure our, uh, the infections were being controlled in the workplace. But with a backdrop of the HSC, uh, flaying, I think would be a word, under, the political, under political pressure, the consequences of uh, governments who have just ignored the infection rates uh, and also, you know, riding high on health and safety narrative, saying that um, too much red tape, uh, that health, uh, was health and safety was too much red tape. Uh, but we need, you know, and others are now saying that we need more robust health and safety laws. But I suppose in our view is, will it ever be enforced? We have all the laws, the good laws in the land. If they're not enforced, then that will not make us any safer. Uh, so we need to think about all these issues. And we've got some great speakers for you this evening. Uh, uh, we've got um, Hilda Palmer, a uh, friend and colleague from... Uh, British Manchester Hazard Centre, who's done some brilliant work over the last two and a half years with the NEU on ventilation, but she's got 40 years experience of occupational health and safety. Uh, we've got Tracy Edwards, who at the beginning of the pandemic hit the ground running in terms of um, supporting PCS members. Uh, she's a PCS National Health and Safety Officer and done some fantastic work over the last uh, two and a half years and it's probably before. Tracy uh, as uh, an officer in, in PCS and we've got um, Jonathan uh, Flux Fluxman who's uh, from um, Doctors in Unite uh, and he's uh, obviously done some brilliant work over the pandemic but also has been involved in the Covid safety pledge uh, and he's going to talk a little bit about that so we're going to hear from them in a min minute but I'll just say that more importantly we want to hear from you as well so we'll, we'll get the speakers to, to say a few words each, and then we're going to um, open it up for a discussion and for us to have a, you know, sort of um, a, a frank discussion really about what's going on in workplaces and what we can do to support you and what we need to, to support each other with. So first off, it's uh, Hilda, and over to you, Hilda. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Gosh, it was a slideshow. I can never do this. Oh gosh, I can never. 
How can I get rid of that? I can never get rid of that thing at the top so that I can actually do the slideshow. Uh, I don't know uh, where I am. Anyway, can everybody see that? Is that okay? Can everybody see? Can everybody see the slide? We can see the slide, but we can see all your slides. Yeah, I know. I can't. I can't get up to the top. I can't get rid of that thing along the top so that I can actually press slideshow. Um, oh, maybe. Hang on. Can I do that? that let me do it. That won't work. Oh. I'm oh, sorry. I don't. No. Oh, lost. Lost it all together now, haven't I? No, no. You're back. You're back on. Can you double click the? Double click it to, anyway. Oh God, what's happened to it? I shouldn't have tried that, should I? No, no. You're all right. Uh, you're, you're back on. Your screen's back on. Yeah, but can you see my slides? Only in the same format as before. Okay, I can't see them at all. Um, sorry about that. Let me just try again. All right, okay. Okay, is that okay? I mean, it's a bit small, but can everybody see that? Is that all right? Can we yeah. just, is it best to just get on? Yeah, it's great, Ilda. We'll, set, we'll send it out afterwards. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, all right. Thanks very much. It's good to speak speaking to you again. We need to talk about um, what we need to know, what we can do. Um, we can't all be experts, but we need to know a little bit about ventilation so that we can actually challenge our employers, um, try and get stuff done in the workplace and actually campaign on this. This is the first, as Janet said, the first World Ventilate Day, which has been set up really by uh, BESA, the Building Engineering Services Association, and Kath Noakes, who's a, a, an aerosol and air quality engineer, and various other engineering um, uh, organizations and, and academics. Um, the, the elephant in the, in, the, in the workplace room is really air pollution. We work in a toxic soup of substances, and we live in one as well, actually. There's more pollution in our homes than we'd really like to know. And this toxic soup of substances is air from the outside, from the building itself, from the work activity, and from the people in the room, you know, the things that we are exhaling and the fungi and pollen and the bacteria and viruses that are around. And all of these things are having a very damaging effect on our health. And ventilation and poor air has, at work have been a huge problem for absolutely decades. Workers and trade union safety reps have fought for years to try and improve the air quality at work. We fought through sick building syndrome, through outbreaks and epidemics of respiratory, and, and other really serious illnesses caused by a toxic indoor air, um, which actually kills thousands of workers every year and makes millions ill. Just recently, a child has died in Rochdale, our eye shock, um, who's two years old. And at the inquest, the pathologist has talked about how this is very clearly related to his exposure to mold in his workplace. Um, which was they found the mold in his, found the fungi in his lungs and in his blood. And we know that Ella Adu Kissy uh, Deborah um, was, is the first person to actually have associated with air pollution on her death certificate when she died of nine of a severe asthma attack. So we need to look at um, you know, ventilation, what is it? What is it good for? It's only airflow, that's all it is. Airflow from outside the building, it can be by natural means, by windows, doors, which trickle vents, bricks, grills, basically holes in the wall, or it can be mechanical heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems where air is drawn in through fans and spread through ducts and vents with filters and all the rest of it. Um, most of our schools are ventilated naturally or not ventilated at all. And so are huge numbers of our workplaces, which means that the ventilation is either extremely poor or very varied. Mechanical heating and ventilation systems are often not properly maintained and not properly installed and are often equally dangerous. So ventilation cleans the air by diluting, dispersing and removing the stale air containing pollutants and a high level of carbon dioxide from breathing, which is warm and humid, and it replaces it with cleaner, cooler, drier air, less pollutants and carbon dioxide and more oxygen. Obviously, that's only true if the outdoor air is clean and not polluted, which isn't the case in lots of our schools and lots of our workplaces. Outdoor air becomes indoor air then with all its pollutants, unless it's filtered in the mechanical heating and ventilation system. And then it's in, in the indoor air, all the stuff from the work activity, from the buildings, um, from the fixtures and fittings, from the people inside, all of that, volatile organic compounds and 
particulate matter and the viruses and bacteria, all of that will be added to the air. So the air inside you know, is often a pretty, pretty pungent mixture. Harmful substances get into our bodies by three ways, ingestion or eating, skin absorption and inhalation. And inhalation is really the biggest fruit. Anything in the air that's a hundred millionths of a meter in diameter, really, really small and below can be inhaled. And if it's very, very small, 2.5 millionths of a meter and below, it can get really deep into the lungs and pass across the lungs into the blood and get around the body to every cell, every organ, to the feet, to a developing fetus and to the, into the brain. So those are the really, really harmful particles. But the, but the other ones can cause harm in our nose and throat and, and cause severe illness and damage to our immune system. We spend 90% of our time indoors. The indoor air can be two to five times more polluted than the outdoor air for reasons I've just described. And we're very worried about the quality of our water. And many, many of us buy bottled water because we don't trust the water in the tap, which isn't really an accurate um, risk assessment. But we, we breathe about 11,000 litres of air a day, whereas we only drink a few litres of water. And we cannot choose when and where to breathe. And we don't all breathe the same air. The poorer you are, the more likely you are to be exposed to much worse quality air at work and at home and everywhere. So reducing the pollutants in the air is going to definitely improve our health. So what sort of standards do we need generally for good health and to um, reduce the risk of inhaling COVID? I should have said at the beginning that there's a longer version of this presentation, which explains a lot of this in a great deal more detail. And it really gives you a lot of references, which you can then adapt to your own campaigns and your own arguments in your workplace. There is so much evidence now from really, really high quality studies from the US White House from the Lancet, from engineering organizations, from absolutely everywhere about the harm that poor ventilation and poor air quality does to our health, how it reduces our concentration, reduces our cognitive ability. In schools, it, it deprives children of their, um, uh, their achievement, their, their ability to learn. It, can, it makes us all sick. It causes far more sickness absence. And, and it, it's, there's so much evidence that it costs huge amounts of money, as well as huge amounts of individual and very unequal damage to all of us. But ventilation then is measured in liters per person per second or cubic meters per person per hour, and also in room changes, air changes per hour. You need to know about this, otherwise employers will bamboozle you with stuff um, that they don't necessarily understand and may be inaccurate, doesn't make any sense, but you need to know about it. The law on this, the health and safety um, workplace welfare regs cover general ventilation space and everything else. And regulation six says effective and suitable provision shall be made to ensure that every enclosed workplace is ventilated by a sufficient quantity of fresh or purified air. That's very important. It doesn't just say outdoor air. It says that air must be fresh or purified. So your employer really has to know what the quality of the outside air is and what they're doing to it to make it better for you to breathe inside, which is obviously harder if we've only got natural ventilation. The guidance in that regulation says the minimum should be five to eight liters per person per second. But during COVID, the Chartered Institute for Building Services Engineers, which the HSE refers employers to, recommends a minimum of 10 liters per person per second. Um, WHO recommends um, six air changes an hour. Some experts recommend much more. Um, and obviously, if we have it the same as outside and it's gale force, it will be more efficient, but it will be very uncomfortable to work in and all your papers will be blowing around. Uh, one air change an hour takes three hours to remove 95% of a pollutant. But if you have six air changes an hour, it would only take half an hour because all the air in the room is replaced every 10 minutes. That's really, really important. The less time the pollutants and the COVID and everything else hangs around in the air, the less risk of you inhaling it. Essentially, the more airflow, the better, um, but obviously thermal comfort is important. So it's important to look at things like filtration of the air to supplement ventilation. And if you have heating and ventilation and air conditioning systems, there can be heat recovery installed into them, but that's not often the case. You can measure ventilation. Your employer really needs to know what the ventilation is and he has to measure it. He or she has to measure it so they know whether they're obeying the law as above and whether they're looking after your health and safety but they don't very often. But how can we make ventilation visible? CO2 level, because you breathe out a lot of CO2, if the ventilation is very poor, the CO2 level will build up. 
And so it can act as a rough proxy for ventilation. And all the best experts in the world say that 600 to 800 parts per million of CO2 in the air is a relatively well ventilated room. And above that is, is more problematic. Um, okay, so carbon dioxide monitors then can make ventilation visible. Um, they have to be non-dispersive infrared um, monitors. And a good one is the Aronet that's um, pictured there below. So we would say, and experts would say that that is that at 600 to 800 parts per million is a relatively well ventilated room. You want to be as near to the outside level as possible. The HSE would agree with that in its, in its guidance, but it won't enforce it. Obviously above that, we would say you need to take some action. And we would say that about five, 1500 parts per million, you shouldn't be really be using the room. The government guidance doesn't reflect that, but we say that's, that's far too high. And that level on my um, CO2 monitor was on a train it's obviously far too high. Why does this matter? Every 400 parts per million of CO2 over the outdoor level is equivalent to 1% of air straight from other people's lungs. And so therefore the relative risk of catching something is higher. This just shows very clearly um, the relationship between the ventilation, the liters per person per second and the CO2 level. And it refers to some NEU uh, documents which help in, in using this. Other things about air quality matter very much like the nitrogen dioxide level, the volatile organic compounds level, particularly indoors, and the particulate matter, the PM10s and PM2.5s. And there are other monitors there. Uh, there's a particular one here that's sold, sold by Smart Air that I've been using called the Qing Ping, um, and that's quite cheap, but also quite um, accurate according to some experts. And there's a very good project the SAMI project in air in schools, which is um, using and selling, giving people these monitors. Um, so essentially what ventilation does, you can see on the right, we've got no ventilation. On the left, ventilation's on. This woman coming into the room on the right, she's breathing out um, her respiratory aerosols and droplets. The droplets are falling to the ground, but the aerosols are spreading throughout the room. So the man on the left could easily inhale them. On the left, we've got the ventilation on, and those aerosols that are dispersed in the air can be sucked out by the ventilation system. So the man at the left is at much less risk. If he was closer to her, he would still be exposed to that dense cloud of her uh, close range aerosols and the droplets. But ventilation sometimes isn't enough, and it isn't enough to remove the close range uh, particles. I'm not gonna go into this in great detail, but just to say we can supplement ventilation with filtration, possibly ultraviolet, C radiation. I'm not going to go into that in too much detail. Um, now you will all have heard, I'm sure, of portable HEPA filters, high efficiency particulate air filtration. It's a technology that's been around for many years, developed to filter out radioactive particles during the Manhattan Atomic Bomb Project. We don't recommend specific ones, but make sure that they're proper certified HEPA filters, and then they will definitely catch the majority of the 0.3 micron particles, even though they felt that they were guaranteed to, to filter them out. And most of the particles that contain COVID are in the 0.5 to 5 micron sort of diameter, say, so that will filter them out. And you've just got to have uh, HEPA filters that provide a sufficient clean air delivery rate for the room size, the number of occupants and the activities. I'm not gonna go into how you measure that, but the detail is in the longer version. And they should really be as quiet as possible, otherwise they won't be used. And you, we don't want them to have anything else like ultraviolet light or the plasma or ionization or anything like that, which would, can damage the, um, can react with other chemicals in the air and cause more irritating particles. Um, there is also do it yourself, um, filters. I'm not going to go into these in very much detail, but they are much cheaper and just as effective. And they're very, very efficient and very useful in schools where the children can get involved in building them as part of a sort of STEM class, science, technology, engineering and maths. And lots of work has been done on showing you how to make really good ones that have been tested for the UK. And there are lots of schools using them. The NEU is involved in projects in um, Warrington and in Somerset. 
Um, okay, so what can we do then? We can use the law, even though the HSE says there's no need for employers to do a specific COVID risk assessment, we still have to push that as far as we can. We can say we have to have a ventilation assessment or an environment assessment, or we have to review it because lots of people are off ill. The Health and Safety at Work Act, the general duty is that employers should provide workplaces as free from risks to the health, safety and welfare of employees and others who may be affected as is reasonably practical and that's a legal test and it means if there's a significant risk of harm then and the cost is not too excessive then that must actually be done. Then there's a management of health and safety at work regs, section uh, regulation three, which means there must be suitable and sufficient risk assessments and then a proper a hierarchy of control follow, followed to control, to eliminate or reduce or control the risks. The workplace health, safety and welfare regs have those specific ventilation standards. And then the safety, the safety reps and safety committee regulations, which give safety reps so many rights to inspect, to investigate, to talk to your members, to consult, to represent them, to get involved and to be consulted in risk assessments and all the rest of it. And so there's a huge amount we can actually do uh, our job is to make that risk assessment as good as it possibly can be. And that means making as good a case as possible for prevention. So in terms of ventilation and in terms of COVID and any other infectious diseases and pollutants, it means looking at, you know, the number of people in the room, their proximity, the activity, how long they're together, um, what the ventilation is, um, what... Um, whether there's any masking, what the airflow is, um, information about the systems that there are, and also looking at things like sickness absence records, uh, concerns of members, short and long-term illness rates, and looking at, the, looking at the cost to the employers, trying to make a case. If it costs £300 to employ a supply teacher, wouldn't it be better to look at, look at some bringing in some HEPA filters? And so you have to make, we have to use all these things as much as we possibly can to make the case for improvements. And, you know, use a risk assessment matrix where it looks at the, you know, the likelihood of harm against the severity. And in, and in terms of COVID, we need to make sure we're making it clear to our employers the seriousness of the ill health effects of infections with COVID. It may be mild, but, but many people actually develop some serious heart and cardiovascular problems afterwards. There's a, there are, there's, a, there's an epidemic of uh, sudden deaths in the 60 days after people have been infected with COVID. Um, there, there is the, if every time you're infected, there's a the risk of you developing long COVID and being even iller. Uh, it damages all your systems and we don't know what the long-term effects are, but we know that long COVID can be severely damaging and can lead to people being off work and also maybe having to leave work. So we have to make sure all those risks are actually uh, factored in. John's going to talk about the COVID pledge and I would just say you know there's a checklist at the end about what we want uh, which just summarised what I've been saying. I've talked far too long, thank you for being tolerant of that. Thanks very much, that's the end of that. Thank you very much Hilda, that was excellent. Uh, um, you have a chance to ask some questions about that and to uh, discuss that in a minute. Uh, I'm going to introduce Tracy next. Uh, so Tracy is National Officer for PCS and she's going to talk about what she's been doing in PC for, with the members in PCS. Over to you, Tracy. Yeah, thanks, Janet. Um, and uh, I've actually not long come off um, some, some annual leave. I've been up in Scotland in the Highlands having a, quite a nice break. So um, for the past sort of couple of weeks, not much, uh, Janet, um, but, but obviously now we're in to, to get stuck back in. Um, I mean, I think... You know, for us, I think you know we've been we've been dis discussing the issue of uh, ventilation and airborne transmission for a while now. I think thank thanks to Hilda and the work that she's done, uh, I think we all have become kind of slight experts um, in in the in the field. And I know that a lot of our reps uh, in PCS have benefited uh, from that massively. Um, and uh, shout out to the the Unison reps, the CEOs here from Edinburgh City Council, who managed to get some funding from the council uh, on investing in Aramark uh, uh, CO two uh, monitoring. Um, and I think that in general in, in PCS, and we've got Carol here from the uh, DWP group who can maybe come in and and, and let us know what's going on in uh, job centres, with the improvements that they've managed managed to make there. 
because in a lot of our areas, you know, we have managed to make, you know, some some quite, you know, good um, improvements. I think that it's quite clear that, you know, everybody's aware of the issue of, of ventilation. Um, I think that, you know, in some of our areas, you know, they're agreeing to do a CO2 monitoring. Um, I think also because of the way that the, the movement and the, the hazards campaign have been able to get the issue uh, out there in the four, you know, in the, the foregrounds that, that it's actually made a lot of management think about, you know, not sort of forcing uh, staff to come back into to the building. So we haven't necessarily seen a big, you know, mass rush uh, back, although that might change with how, how high energy uh, bills are going to become. Um, so, you know, and, and, and from that point of view, I think in, in many of our sort of Whitehall areas, I think that our reps are kind of quite, quite happy with, you know, the kind of low occupancy levels. Um, some of our buildings have got not bad sort of mechanical uh, ventilation, although I was up at a Scottish uh, government building uh, in Edinburgh yesterday, St Andrew's House. Um, and it's uh, a building that has got no mechanical uh, ventilation. It's, it was built in the 1930s. Um, and, and basically, you know, it's, there's not many people in there, but, um, you know, they, they are encouraging people to, to open the window um, as, as their method of, of, of ventilation, ventilating uh, that building. Um, of course, it's, it's, near the, the, it's near the, you know, the city centre. Um, as well, so it'd be interesting to see if they're doing any sort of, you know, monitoring of uh, particulate matter um, in that building. Um, but nonetheless, I think that you know our our reps seem to be generally, you know, I'm I'm not getting, you know, it, it, you know, compared to you know we we're at the height of COVID, obviously we were seeing, um, you know, we we're having battles such as at the D DVLA. I, I'm not seeing at the moment, you know, um, reps kind of, you know, um, concerned um, around the issue uh, of, of ventilation at the moment. And I think that that's a general picture uh, in society in general. I think that um, a lot of people um, are sort of, you know, COVID is, is either over or, you know, we're just sort of um, living with it. Um, so we're not really seeing the concrete improvements uh, to buildings um, uh, that we need uh, in order to address the, you know, a lot of the issues um, that Hilda talks about. You know, not only that, you know, the, you know, poor indoor air quality was an issue before COVID. It always has been. It, it, it you know. Uh, it you know, gives us all sorts of cognitive issues as well as as lung issues, and then obviously there's also the question of other air uh, pollutants uh, as as well as air pollu pollution. And I think the heat wave in the summer uh, also brought into to sharp focus about you know that the the importance of 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 good indoor air quality. We had a number of our members that you know a number of you know members and members of you know you know members of the public couple uh, who actually fainted uh, as a result of the you know the heat um that was uh, you know in, in that museum and of course our our reps were able to make sure that uh, you know that the the museum was closed um earlier um but uh, but again you know as as bad as it is you know uh you know any you know our our productivity um, is reduced uh, and, and we also end up with, with other problems and, and we're going to have more heat waves, uh, we're going to have more uh, pandemics um, and that's going to be a feature, um, you know, uh, unless, you know, unless we, you know, unless the the the, the massive investment um, and, and, you know, the, the, the infrastructure is put in place to, to actually uh, make our buildings uh, safe because, you know, um, you know, we're seeing more people getting reinfected. We're seeing the question of um, long COVID. Um, you know, Hilda's mentioned about, you know, sickness um, absence. Um, but I think that, you know, there's also the question that, you know, and Jonathan will go into this as well, about the fact that we still have quite a significant amount of people who are who are shielding, still shielding, um, or who are looking after someone um, who is, you know, we still have people who are terrified of, of catching um, the virus, and we still have people who are traumatised uh, by the whole um, episode um, who are not participating fully uh, in society. And then, and of course, as winter comes, uh, we're going to see more people in, in indoor venues such as pubs and, you know, the theatre, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, combined with the, 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 you know, the flu epidemic. It's a real public health uh, crisis that we've got on our hands. Um, you know, they're just continuing, continuing to make us um, alert. 
um, you know, if it's not, you know, brain fog, you know, I think, um, you know, most people I know uh, at the moment are suffering from from brain fog, you know, or or, or the issue uh, of of long COVID. We, you know, we're also going to see the effects uh, of work related stress um, continuing to build the intensification um, of work um, and how the government are going to deal with any future uh, sort of public health um, emergency. Um, so, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I'm sort of painting a bit of a bleak uh, picture there, I guess. Um, but I would also say that I think that, you know, um, I think that perhaps, you know, more needs, you know, the trade union movement um, itself. I think, you know, we need to be looking at how we can you know, get the question uh, of indoor air uh, quality uh, back on the agenda uh, and how it can be framed in terms of, you know, the, the public, uh, the, you know, the long term. Um, health um, implications um, that's going to that's going to stem from this, um, and uh, I'll leave it there, Janet. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Trace. That's excellent, and it you know, and you absolutely highlights loads of issues that uh, reps are facing and members are experiencing. But uh, you know, one of the things that we've got to look at is you know, with the education for workers of what's happening, because although we've been talking about this for a long time. There's been a lot of misinformation about uh, what about COVID and where we're at with the COVID pandemic, and we have to look at, you know, how we can put that back on the agenda. Just as you said, you know, put this back on the agenda. How do we? What you know? What's the view of the trade union movement? How are we going to react and respond to uh, to get our workplaces to a position, uh, really, where Hilda started the discussion, you know, and uh, and has talked about earlier. Um, so we're going to uh, pass on to Jonathan now, who's gone, who's, uh, been involved in the uh, COVID safety pledge uh, and for him to talk a bit about that. Jonathan, thank you. Thanks very much, Janet. Um, and can I just say it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, Hazards have done fantastic work, as I'm sure everybody in this meeting knows, and it's, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you and also to share a platform with both Hilda and Tracy. We've been real stalwarts throughout the, the pandemic in terms of raising the importance of airborne transmission and doing everything we can within the trade union movement to, to prevent it and to minimize <coughs> it. Okay, so I'm just gonna share my screen and get my slides up. If you give me a second. Uh, great. Um, okay, can you see that all right? Yeah. Great. Okay. So you've asked me to talk about um, the COVID safety pledge and, and how we can use it to, to take action. So that's who I am, a member of Doctors in Unite and also on the Brent Trades Council EC. So the COVID safety pledge was a, an initiative by Independent Sage and, and several trade unions and was launched um, in the earlier part of this year as a way of raising the issue of COVID safety. Um, no doubt everybody's aware that we've been battling against a concerted and coordinated campaign of minimization and denial that the pandemic is important, it's all over, infections don't really matter, you know, as long as you're vaccinated, you're okay. And quite clearly that's not the case, but it's had some, some dreadful ramifications and implications for, for millions of people. Um, so um, it's possible and indeed desirable to raise, to keep raising the issue of COVID safety, to counter that. And it's really, really important that we keep talking about it with our friends, family, workplaces, communities, and so on. Because this thing ain't over, and it's not going to be over, <clears throat> excuse me, until we actually address it in an organized way. And that means addressing airborne transmission. This thing is airborne, it always has been. And until and unless we take effective action, it will stay with us in a, in a rampant and uncontrolled way. Um, and uh, it's worth adding that the pledge was born out of official failure and determination to just deny that the pandemic mattered any longer. 
you know, if the government did everything it could and put in, in place the mitigations, we wouldn't need to be doing any of this. And throughout the pandemic, and I'm sure many people in the audience share this frustration, we've been fighting not only the virus, but the government and official organizations all throughout. And it's been, it's been a slog. But I'm very encouraged that particularly in the last six months to a year, the message is definitely getting through. And lots of people in the trade union movement and in local communities understand what's going on and the importance of, of mitigations. Okay, so I won't go into all the, the numbers. People here are probably well informed, but just today, for example, as a quick point to make, 148,000 new cases every day on the Zoe app and 2.4 million active cases across the UK. So COVID is still very much present. And it's, it's important to say that they're not gonna come and save us. We've got to do this ourselves. And so the critical thing is to work together to try and mitigate risk, to stop transmission as much as we can and, and avoid getting infected or infected again. Most of us have been infected at least once, but there's good evidence now that second, third and fourth infections, not only does the individual risk of each infection repeat itself, it's a multiplying effect. So two infections is more than double the risk of no infections. It's, it's almost three or four times the risk. And it's very important to keep that in mind. So stopping infections is, is really, really important. So that's what the pledge is. It's a, it's a simple statement, which we're asking employers in particular to, to um, take up, but it applies to really any organization employers, businesses, trade unions, community organizations, local authorities, it doesn't matter what body it is. The people that are responsible for running that organization should really be, be looking at things like this and considering taking these, these measures. And it's, it's a very simple statement. We pledge to protect our staff, uh, workers and customers from COVID, assessing the environment in the workplace or in the building or the organization that you work in or operate in, and critically important to um, abide by the, the best public health advice, although one must be careful not to say official advice because we know how rubbish that's been throughout the pandemic. And it's very important to look for reliable sources. Um, quite clearly, the political agenda of the government is being reflected in many official organizations. So you need to be careful about who you listen to. But critically important to allow workers to have sufficient time off and not to lose pay so they can stay at home until they recover and come back so that they're well enough to come back to work, but also don't spread the, the disease inside workplaces. Um, he has the website where we are. Um, it's still under development, so bear with us. Um, it's a little bit out of date and you need to scroll down to see the detail. There's a sign up form on the website where you can actually sign up to the pledge yourselves um, as organizations. So please do use that if you haven't done it already. And here are some of the organizations that have signed up. Um, it's been quite successful so far. Unfortunately, we're, we're not up to date with everybody, um, but we soon hope to, to uh, get the website up and running properly. But you can see here, there are a number of trade unions, and I'd like to just draw your attention to these community organizations, the Clinically Vulnerable Families, Long COVID SOS, and the Bereaved Families for Justice organizations. Now, those, those groups of, of, of people have been particularly hard hit by the pandemic. And there was a very moving presentation on Friday, uh, some people may have seen it at Independent Sage, of the impact that being clinically vulnerable in the ongoing unmitigated uh, pandemic is having on people's lives and how isolated they are two and a half years down the line with no light at the end of the tunnel. So the more uh, safety measures we can put in place as communities and things, the better able uh, clinically vulnerable people will be able to take part at least to some extent in normal society and normal everyday life. 
Um, there's copies of our leaflet, which you can download and print off. It's a back-to-back -back thing, A5 size. So if you're getting it printed, just send that off and the printer will just stick it on, on uh, uh, make a double-sided leaflet. Um, so it's not a detailed implementation plan. It's, a, it's a, like a, an opening gambit, if you want, or a, a foot in the door to start to discuss um, ways and means of, of combating COVID in your trade union, in your community group, in, in your place of employment, et cetera, et cetera. So some examples of what has been done. Um, this is not uh, in any uh, way meant to be uh, exhaustive, but just some examples. Uh, my union, Unite, has adopted the pledge nationally and they're implementing uh, risk reduction measures within uh, the buildings of, owned by the, by the union, all meetings organized by the union. Um, they're now considering COVID safety measures and putting mitigations in place. It's important to add that hybrid meetings are important if you're organizing meetings so that people who still feel unsafe can still take part. And uh, people have rightly raised complaints that they feel excluded if they're clinically vulnerable, can't get there or just don't feel safe. Unison GMB and Unite have recently written to the Children's Commissioner asking her to uh, demand from the government air filters in every school. Only nearly 1,300 schools out of nearly well, over 24,000 have them in place. And uh, according to the government, this is, this is enough and clear, quite clearly it's not. Um, we've got some model resolutions. If you're in a trade, a local trades union or trades council or local organizations, which you can download and the link is there, which basically says that you sign up to it and you will um, abide by the, the uh, by the pledge and do what you can to mitigate spread. Um, we're very pleased to work with Hazard's campaign to produce this guide, which is a detailed guide about how to organize uh, conferences and meetings and reduce risk um, in terms of ventilation, air filtration, testing before you go and wearing good quality masks. And again, the link is there if you'd like it. Examples of local authorities, Glasgow City Council recently produced 5,000 CO2 monitors, apparently enough for every classroom in the city, which is great. North Somerset Council has recently signed up to the pledge. What we really need to get on and do now in the pledge campaign is, is reach out to these organizations and discuss with them the detail of what they're doing and how they're actually implementing it on the ground. But here's one example. Um, this chap is, is Oliver Patrick, he's a, he's a councillor in North Somerset, uh, sorry, not in, North, in Somerset, and he's uh, been working with a local primary school and now the whole school has got a, um, an air filter in every classroom. And it's a great way of mobilising the local community actually, working with schools, the kids can do it, they can help build them, these DIY box fans, and I'll show you some pictures later on. Um, the older kids can actually get into the maths and, and the, the science of, of how air filters work and how ventilation works. The younger ones can use the, the duct tape and help actually build them. They can decorate them. And in the US, it's, it's a really big, big community movement. But here's a great example of how it's been done here in the UK. Um, this is an example of a, of a cafe in Ontario in Canada. Um, Twitter's a marvelous thing. I hope it's going to stay that way uh, after recent developments. But um, it enables us to make contact with people all over the world. This is a cafe where they've got about a place for about 100 customers. They did an air quality assessment. They use CO2 monitors. You can see the Aronet 4 monitor here reading 495, which is an excellent reading. They've got it, they're putting up a certificate in the window saying that they've got clean air from HEPA filters. And I've been in contact with the owner via Twitter and he assures me not a single member of staff has been infected with COVID since they've taken these measures. And that's a small business and this could be reproduced, you know, many, many times over. So, you know, in our daily lives as individuals, 
members of the public, consumers, commuters, users of public service services. There's lots that we can do to raise the issue, you know, in our in our day to day lives. So if you you know lose the local restaurant, talk to the manager when you when you go there, or if you're passing, talk to the supermarket manager, ask them about the uh, the pledge. You know, have some leaflets with you, raise it with them. If you can afford to get a CO2 monitor, do buy one. Um, the best one is quite expensive; it's about 200 quid, but there are cheaper ones. Um, and it's really an invaluable tool in demonstrating whether ventilation is adequate or not. It really is a, a very convincing thing to just to show somebody. Look, it's the, the monitor's saying 1800. It's not safe in here. Uh, you know, my own little tale. I went to the optician a couple of months ago. I walked in. It was, it was during that hot uh, spell we had, the really hot weather, and the air, the aircon was on. And it felt lovely and cool, but the CO2 monitor was actually reading 1800. And clearly what they were doing was cooling the air, but they were not bringing in outside air. So as, as Hilda emphasized, you have to replace the air. You have to change the air in the space. Otherwise the virus will still be circulating. So I left and I, I went back another day when it was quieter to get my eyes tested and get my new glasses. Um, Get in touch with us if you if you do any of the stuff. We'd really like to hear from you at the campaign. You know, we'll put the information up on our website so everybody can share what they're doing. Raise it in your union, at a branch level, regional and national level if you can. In your community organization, start a campaign. It, it, it really is an issue that people can mobilize around and take uh, joint action together. Uh, Brent Trades Council, for example, all our meetings. I take along my CO2 monitor. It's on the table in front of us when we meet. We opened, we had to open the windows the other day and uh, the level came down to a safe level and everybody was reassured. And in fact, we had a recent fundraising event where we were celebrating 100 years of trade union history in Brent. And we were able to work with the, the, the venue beforehand to look at the ventilation in the hall um, they had a door and some windows, and they actually had a, a rather antiquated uh, um, air, fil non air filtration, but it seemed to be a fan, but it did help circulate the, the air. And we built a couple of, of uh, these DIY box filters and put them in the space. And as a result, the, the venue was much, much safer than it would have been. And then just at a, on a personal level, Please do everything you can to stay safe yourselves. You know, I'm assuming people in this audience are interested in this and you will be trying your best to, to influence other people. You know, you are the people who are really, really important in this struggle. Keep yourselves healthy so that you can fight the fight. Wear a good quality mask. Don't go into crowded spaces. If the, if the train carriage is really crowded, wait for the next one if you can. Stand by the open window at the end of the tube train if you're in London or, um, I mean, packed commuter trains, packed intercity commuter trains, I find the absolute worst, or the central line in London. The, the, the readings there are really quite dangerous. So if you can, go to a quiet carriage or take a train where, it, where it's quieter. And I'll just show you some tracings here of readings that I've taken. Excuse me, this is the Aronet 4 monitor. It does talk by Bluetooth to, to your smartphone. So you don't even have to take it out your pocket. Um, you can leave it in your pocket. It does take accurate readings while the thing is in your pocket. And I did check this with uh, a professor of chemistry in the US who knows his stuff. So you don't even have to take it out your pocket. And in fact, it's better to not have it in front of you on the table because when you breathe out, there is a cloud of CO2 that comes out your mouth and nose, and it can artificially raise it temporarily. So the readings may not be that accurate. So keep it away from where you're breathing, your breathing zone. Um, and just look at your smartphone and, and you get a lovely graph from the app. And this was a train journey down to Bristol that I took, I think it was the year before last, October, 2020, 21, can't remember, sorry. But you can see it was, 2,300 pack train. Um, I wrote to GWR and they, of course they tried to palm me off with some nonsense about 
oh, the, the, my readings weren't accurate and the ventilation is very good. But the more people that raise it and demand good ventilation on public transport, the better. This was actually the train journey up to the Hazards Conference. Um, so it was London up to Stoke-on-Trent. You can see up here, almost 2,000 on the journey up there, very crowded train. This is a journey back down to London, a much quieter train coming down. But that was me on the central line coming back home to West London. Very high, dangerous reading at 3,000. So, you know, I had my FFP3 mask with me. But looking around that train carriage, you know, I was probably one of maybe two or three other people who was masked. And that's the problem with the government narrative, that most people will pay attention to them, will listen to the government and trust the government. Um, so do keep yourself safe. And then lastly, um, those are the, the DIY uh, filters that we built ourselves. Um, you know, a couple of, of fans, four box, four filters that you tape together on a wooden base with some wheels and takes a couple of hours to make them. And they are incredibly efficient and highly effective. And for anybody who doubts that, you know, because it's a DIY job, they may not be that effective. Um, the company 3M, who people might have heard of, who make safe uh, masks and all kinds of medical products, they tested these in their labs alongside other air filtering devices, commercially made ones, you know, with the pretty uh, logos and the facade and everything. And these outperformed them every single time. So they're incredibly effective. Noise can be a bit of an issue. So it depends on where you want to use them, but there are ways around that you can run the fans on slower speed or get uh, uh, smaller devices. Okay, I think I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was excellent. And you've given us some really useful uh, pointers for things that we should be doing. Lots of uh, lots of issues that you've raised. Um, and, you know, and the importance of using the safety pledge to get the issue raised again with your employers. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a vehicle for doing that, for looking at mitigations in your own workplaces and for, for taking more action. Um, so, Really, it's open to you now. Is there any questions you want to ask? Uh, any issues you want to raise? Uh, any experiences that you've got? Any good, good uh, practice that's going on in your workplace? Or any challenges that you're facing? Um, that's what we want to hear about really now. Ian. Thanks, Janet, and thanks to all the speakers as well. Really informative. Um, just a quick couple of points. Um, Tracy was absolutely correct. We managed to secure some funding for um, CO2 monitors for particularly schools that were in a linked um, monitors. And we actually have mobile ones. We've had them for about a year and a half in the schools. The problem we have now is actually getting people that can install them properly. Um, and so there's a delay in that at the moment. And what was to happen was that as the installation of the um, electric monitors went and that would free up the mobile ones to put in the depots and locality offices that really have been working all, all the way through the pandemic without any, um, you know, they, they would have their risk assessments and their safe working procedures, which we were he heavily involved in, but they didn't have any CO2s and they still, most of them still don't now. Um, Worryingly, over the last couple of days, we've now found out that they're shutting two of our street coins and depots and moving all, all of the staff, 80 plus, um, from two shifts into one port of cabin, which is really tight. I've seen it over the last couple of days, and I've got real concerns about that, which I've already highlighted, um, both to elected members and um, uh, our health and safety team as well. So. There's an issue around that um, the CO2 is getting installed. There's also an issue around the government um, information, which I've said continuously has been fundamentally flawed and I've been particularly critical of Jason Leach, um, who I just think does not have a, a, an iota, an idea about um, people coming back to work and working in, in spaces that 
you know, we've got over 600 buildings in our estate in Edinburgh, and the vast majority of them, uh, you're, we're now shoeboxing, shoehorning, sorry, uh, people back in to, um, into locality offices and depots especially. But I just want to raise one other thing as well, and it's probably indicative of what's going on through the whole of the UK at the moment with the cost of living crisis, fuel poverty, Edinburgh is now looking at setting up heat hubs, or as they call them, warm spaces in uh, libraries and in community centres. And at a recent council meeting, I watched it on Saturday morning on the webcast, there was not one single question raised by elected members or council officials about the concerns that I highlighted to them. There's a small paragraph within the report but not one single mention of it. Um, they are putting far too much emphasis on the community centre management teams. Um, the council's basically wiping their hands of the responsibility or accountability if there is an outbreak, and they don't even have a plan on how to support the elderly or vulnerable if, they, um, if an outbreak occurs and they've got to you know, get them home and then make sure that they're going to be safe, especially if they live on their own. But there's also that inequality um, aspect of it because there's disabled people, there's immune suppressed people, there's mental health issues. These individuals, and especially the ones that stay on their own, will not have the opportunity to go into a heat hub or a warm space, and they will be impacted the most because they will have to heat their own homes. And I said on Saturday, uh, our public meeting, that there will be people that will die because they can't afford to heat or eat. Thanks, Janet. Thanks very much, Ian. You've raised loads of issues there. Uh, and absolutely, you know, this, uh, this inequality is going to impact on the lives and livelihoods of people. Um, uh, you know, and I think as, as trade unionists, as um, safety reps, you know, they're in, they're in the order, they're, in, they're attending tonight, then we need, we need to put it in health and safety terms a lot of this. You know, what safe systems of work have we, have we got in place to, to prevent infections, you know, to mitigate infections and to prevent infections? Um, and, you know, perhaps we need to be thinking about some written, some clear written guidelines, you know, guidance that we give out to reps to, to raise with their employers or raise in communities. You know something a bit more really than what we've done. I mean, we've got we've we had lots of these meetings, haven't we? We had lots of advice that we give we give out, but it's still not you know for some people it's still not getting the message across there. And perhaps the official dumb and the government you know are, are um, turning a blind eye to it all. You know that we need to remind them officially that COVID is not over. That infections are still rife in going into winter it's going to, only going to get worse and we've got some real problems coming up with the, the new variants that are, that are circulating. Um, and so we need to perhaps think about other things like that to, uh, to support people. Right, what else? Carol. Thanks, Janet. Um, during COVID, I mean, Hilda gave us a lot of help and um, it gave us the ammunition to challenge management. However, even where we convinced them to use CO2 monitors, they were testing at 1500 ppm because they reckoned that was safe and they would not accept our argument that it wasn't. So we do need some more guidance printed out there because these are allegedly qualified people telling us that we're wrong. Then, of course, our employer, the government, decided that COVID had gone. And so our employers ripped up the risk assessments and said, we don't need it anymore, COVID has gone. There was, especially in our job centres, terrible rush to get everyone back in the office. Not quite so bad in the back of house staff because they introduced hybrid, but that wasn't them being nice. It was so they could close more offices and have less offices if people worked hybrid. Um, that causes other health and safety issues, like you've got to have enough fire wardens and first aiders on every day that people are in the office and they had to make sure that they had uh, rotors in place to check they had the right coverage and things like that. So there's been lots of issues from hybrid, 
But one of my main concerns is that when people can't work from home because they can't afford to have the heating on and they all want to go back, will there be enough space for them to be working in the office? Because like I said, they have closed a number of offices. In fact, my own office closed during the pandemic and we got moved to another office. Um, there's huge issues. We do have a risk assessment that's called COVID and other respiratory illnesses. And the only decent bit in it is that they say people can work from home if they got COVID rather than go in the office because they don't want them to go to the office if they're contagious. And our argument is, of course, if they're too ill to work, they shouldn't be working. Not whether they're well enough to work from home because they're contagious. So I think we've got huge fights coming up, but the biggest one is COVID's gone. So we don't need anything in place. And that's very frustrating for us. So I think we need to get rearmed again to have another fight. Yeah, thanks, Carol. I think your, your points are well made, you know, and we see that across all different workplaces, different sectors and different industries. You know, they're all facing the similar, similar issues. Hilda, did you want to come back on something? Yes, just very quickly, um, um, the very good comments that everybody's made and particularly picking up what Carol was saying. I mean, the real, the thing we have to, what we have to be really clear about is identifying what are the real barriers and what are the real sticking points. We have lots of information. And I know a lot of people will say information is power, but that's absolute nonsense. Information is just information. And what makes it powerful is organizing around it and collective action behind it. Um, but we are in a really, really difficult, difficult stage. Everybody has, has referred to it. We've got the tools, we've got the knowledge, we have the facts from trustworthy sources. But what we are up against is the fact that the government has very clearly said it's over. The HSE says there's no need for any specific uh, COVID risk assessments. I had a stand up row with a senior member of the HSE at their recent open meeting in July in Bootle, where he said that there was absolutely no occupational connection with COVID and there was absolutely nothing at all that employers could do. And I, despite the fact that I said that every place that people were catching COVID is in a workplace. It may not be your workplace, you've caught it, but it will be in someone else's workplace. And therefore, the need is to prevent it in all of them. But what we have this, we have this serious problem. And it, um, Jonathan talked about the fact that, you know, that the public, um, oh, there is so much misinformation and disinformation and, and outright lies. Um, and Jonathan talked about not relying on, you know, the, the official public health guidance. The problem is our employers are relying on that. And that is what they will say that's what, what they will say stand and no matter what we say now I think we have to we have to really think about how we're going to take this forward I think the pledge is a really good idea because it takes it off slightly to the side and as Jonathan said it's a foot in the door it's coming from a slightly different angle but we can use it as trade unionists in you know in a sort of Trojan horse way and try to get that discussion going and if we base it around issues of like keeping people in work and productivity and reduce costs and those sort of things. I think there are ways in which we can do that. But I think we have a real problem within our trade union movement. And I think we have to be serious about this. Are, are the leaders of our trade unions think it's all over and have passed on and gone on to something else. And that's a, that's a really serious problem. I think we have to think about, we do have to put down a marker and say, it isn't over. This is all the, we have to actually, you know, stake this out again. These are lies. COVID is not over. It's still killing people. It's still making them ill. It's still creating more and more long COVID people. It's creating a huge individual and, and societal health, health, social and economic disaster on top of everything else we have. And so I think we have to push this further up the agenda within our own trade unions as well and have, we need trade union leaders coming out and actually backing us up on this and backing up safety reps and backing up workers who are trying to fight this. Thanks, Hilda. Um, just before I bring in Jonathan, uh, just a couple of things then. Uh, I will circulate a document we've just produced in the Northwest on long COVID, and it was to try and um, put a chart on the agenda to try and force our employers to start to look at the consequences of infections as much as 
as much as sorry okay uh, yeah as much as um as much as we know you know that they there should be controls there it's just to say you know the consequences of people being infected are you know that you could be challenged to personal injury cases and things like that and to try and force it that way so i'll circulate that because you might find that useful or interesting for you to take the issue up um jonathan thanks janet yeah and, and thanks for all the helpful for comments and contributions um yeah, yeah and your point about the the warm space is very well made um you know as somebody's already said the most vulnerable people are going to be using them and you know are we going to be creating uh hubs for infection for covid spread if you're putting people in warm spaces which are going to be poorly ventilated they're going to be vulnerable by definition it's it's a sitting duck for covid transmission I just wanted to come back to the 1500 uh, uh, ppm limit that Carol that you raised. You know, we, we I looked into this in great detail at the time, and it's interesting how this this limit came to be within the official documentation. Professor Catherine Noakes, who chairs one of the Sage uh, uh, subgroups, tweeted out 1500 is the, the, the level at which spaces should receive absolute priority for intervention. And then that became the limit for taking any action within government guidance. And it's, it's really very clear how that limit, uh, that, that number was arrived at. And if you look across the board, across the world, all the experts, as Hilda said, they all say 600 to 800, you know, the, the aerosol scientists who were the ones that that uh, uh, confirmed for us um, that this this disease is airborne, that the virus is airborne. And to my mind, these people deserve the Nobel Prize for medicine and for science. They have advanced our understanding of infectious disease enormously. And to my mind, a, a discovery that's much, much greater in terms of its implications than, than the new vaccines. Although we do need vaccines, I'm not knocking them. Don't misunderstand me. Um, these people are saying uh, 600 to 800, all of them. Um, I just wanted to come back on a couple of points. You know, the, the, the politics of COVID is very interesting and very important. You know, um, one of these professors in, in the US said, you know, droplet spread, i.e. Not, not airborne, is very convenient for governments and corporations and institutions because it means it's all on the individual then. That means you got infected because you didn't wash your hands, right? Or you didn't have your vaccination. Whereas if it's airborne, they are gonna to have to clean the air that we all breathe. And the reason that the, the pandemic continues unabated is because we are not cleaning indoor air. And unless and until we do that, as I've said, it will carry on. And to take that argument further, the fact that we know what the science of, of this disease is and how to, to mitigate it. And the fact that governments are not doing it and that the ruling class is not doing it is effectively an attack on the working class and ordinary people in this country and across the globe. They know what needs doing. They are simply not prepared to spend the money to protect us. So it's a, it's a highly political issue, COVID mitigation. And if I might do, sorry to take up your time, but I just wanted to share my screen one more time to show you something about um, COVID transmission and why cleaning indoor spaces in public spaces is really, really important. People will remember that after about six months to a year, we started talking about super spreading events in, in uh, in relation to, to transmission. According to, again, according to the government and their, their, their enablers and their minimizers, it's all one-to-one -one transmission, mostly in the home and, and an awful lot of transmission does occur like that. But the critical driver are these super spreader events. This is a diagram from a study done in schools, which shows that the infection spreads within institutions like schools, almost like a cluster bomb. You know, those dreadful weapons that have been banned by many countries, but not by others, in fact. 
you know, the explosive device goes off and then it releases 10 or 20 or 50 smaller devices, which then are scattered and then explode themselves. And this is how super spreading occurs. And you can see in this diagram that, you know, this, this bit, for example, one individual there infected those individuals there, and they went on to infect these people and those people and so on. These are the one-to-one -one transmissions within households and within the community. And there's a, there's a very interesting um, uh, architect based in, in, in Dublin, uh, a woman called uh, Olga Hegarty, who at least a year ago was saying that there are about 600 buildings in Dublin that if they could put in proper mitigations, her estimation was they could actually stop transmission or greatly reduce it within the city. So it goes to show that, you know, it's not every single space that needs to be ventilated or, or filtered, although that would be helpful. But if we, do, if we did it in a targeted way, public transport, you know, big halls where, where lots of people congregate, uh, workplaces are absolutely critical. And we've seen in the early days of the pandemic, you remember the meatpacking plants and the sandwich factories here in Britain, up and down the country, we had outbreaks of hundreds and hundreds of cases. It was big, uh, super spreading events like that. And then all those workers go home and give it to their families, who then go out into the community and then it spreads to the community. So that's critically important to remember that it's super spreading that's driving the, the, um, the, uh, the pandemic. Thanks, I'll stop there. Thanks, Jonathan. That's a, a good reminder. And I think we should be aware that super spreading events don't just happen in workplaces, but at conferences organized, organized by trade unions. You know, so the point that was made before about trade unions needing to take the lead, I think is essential. We know that one of at least one major trade union last year had to abandon the conference because of the number of people that were infected at the conference. You know, so we need to ensure that our houses are clean, our conferences are organized right to control any uh, spread of the virus, as well as, you know, taking the lead really to our employers. But I, I think I'm just mindful to say, you know, we've got all the information. We know what the information, we know what keeps us safe in the workplace. I mean, both Hilda and Jonathan and Tracy have said before, we know all that. What we need to do is to, inf to ensure our employers are doing it, to ensure that you're safe, you know, that they are following the control measures that are in that control hierarchy approach to controlling the risks that we are facing in the workplaces. You know, and we do that, I think, as uh, Hilda said, as uh, by organising properly, you know, org organising as trade unions, uh, collectivising the issues uh, around health and safety issues, which, are, uh, you know, we've got all the legislation for. We just need to make sure and force our employers to do it and force the enforcers to, uh, to control those risks, uh, to enforce the legislation as well. Uh, I'll just bring in Ian and then Tracy. And then I think that's probably enough time then, Ian. Very quickly, John. Um, I think Calder's got a really good point and I spoke about this on Saturday in our public meeting. I don't think that the trade union movement, particularly my own uh, trade union, is actually leading by example. They're encouraging me to actually challenge my employer. And yet when I go into my office, there's no CO2s. They haven't signed the pledge. They haven't... Um, they haven't got HEPAs, and uh, I bought two CO2s for our um, real sharing with the region and the, the health branch. I've watched our CO2 readings go from um, low 400s to probably 450 with the windows open, um, but as more people are coming into the office, they, we've got low ceilings, the heating's now on, the windows are shut. It's fluctuated between 600 and 950 when the windows have had to be opened. And yet, every time I, last Friday, I asked to do a wee exercise in a training room. The first training, room, uh, training course we had, where there was 10 members, 10 reps, three, um, three uh, tutors. And I was told by the senior tutor, I couldn't put a CO2 unit in the training room because they were a non believer. Now, that's okay for that individual, but what about the other 12 that were in that room? That may have alleviated 
any anxieties. And the trade union movement really must have a look at themselves. They're asking us to encourage employers, and yet they don't do it themselves. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. I mean, it's an absolute nonsense, that, isn't it? We don't run, we don't, uh, run safety on the basis of people not believing that you need to be, you know, have um, risks controlled if one person didn't want to control those risks. It has to be, you know, the, the safety of everyone. Does anybody else want to make a point before I bring in Tracy? Just want to give you an opportunity. I mean, if you've got any points you want to, any questions you want to ask, then please continue to um, to email us and we'll get back to you. Uh, I say we'll circulate the information, but just want to give you an opportunity to come back. Over to you, Tracy. Well, I, I don't think there's much more that needs to be said. I think it's it's mainly been covered, hasn't it? Um, I think that, you know, I would experience in PCS is that, you know, man, management are not going to, um, you know, man, management are not going to move and, and, and do what's necessary unless they feel the pressure uh, coming uh, from the workforce or, or recognise it themselves, you know. Um, so, we, we, you know, it's been a good discussion in terms of, I think we all agree that, you know, we need to now be sort of talking about how we get it back on the agenda. Um, and it's given me a lot of, um, you know, good ideas and, and, and you know, reflection in terms of, you know, how where we go next in, in PCS, because we're looking to get our um, health national health and safety forum um up and running now now that we've you know our sort of national ballot for, for industrial action um is now concluded um so that'll be something that we'll be looking at in the next sort of you know you know in the next couple of months um we'll be holding that and and just you know i think it's a question of you know why is indoor air quality a political and an industrial issue um should really be the the topic for discussion um as much as there is a public health um crisis uh, developing um you know and if this is something that jonathan has sort of mentioned um in the past that this really is a an engineering uh, problem um as well um i'm hoping that everybody can you know use the pledge um you know successfully and and that that will be something that we can use to to take this forward but just to say as well that we're quite a small steering committee um at the moment it's it's only myself jonathan janet phil taylor and and stephen reicher from independent sage at the moment uh we are holding a um supporters meeting on the 20 23rd of november where we're going to discuss you know how we can sort of get, get you know get more activity around the pledge and, and and get a bit of a strategy going but you know i should I, i'm sure i speak for for everyone on the steering committee that we are looking for any more volunteers of, of people who want to, to to come in and and help uh, push the pledge. I mean, Jonathan's obviously alluded to the fact that, you know, he's done some fantastic work in Barnet Trades Council and he's passed, you know, got resolutions passed and and, and now, you know, the Greater London uh, Association of Trades Councils now, you know, has has adopted the position um, of the pledge, you know, and, and as Ian's quite rightly pointed out, you know, we have to be sort of looking more uh, in terms of, you know, this is a, a community issue. Um, and really, you know, there's a lot of campaigns on at the moment, isn't there? You know, We've got the, the People's Assembly, we've got the, the big massive, um, you know, gatherings of the Enough is Enough campaign. And, and, and really as well, you know, there's no reason why um, the question of, of public health, the question of, of indoor air shouldn't really be raised, um, you know, within those um, arenas um, as well, because I think that, you know, if, if anything, um, you know, we, we've, you know, we, we have got the, the COVID public inquiry and see, see where that takes us, but we will not see um, the justice that, that we need uh, in terms of, of all of this. As I said, we're going to have more pandemics, aren't we? I think that's fairly that's fairly obvious um and and i suppose at some point you know we will be saying is enough is enough uh when it comes to uh, our uh, public health um and uh, the question of you know having clean air uh hopefully will um hopefully will you know rise back up on on the agenda um so thanks very much um i'll leave it there thank you tracy it was a great summary uh and thank you very much for um uh, all the speakers tonight there's some really good suggestions i think that you can take it forward and i know people are frustrated about the lack of controls the lack of um information about covid now but we have to get that back on the agenda we have to do something and one of the ways we can do it is to get your trade unions to sign up to the pledge get your employers to sign up to the pledge get your local supermarket to sign up for the pledge 
anywhere we're going to try and raise that issue. Um, and also to uh, try and insist that we have hybrid meetings wherever we can, you know, so that we've got less people in a room for less time and we've got more control of the air quality. But, you know, absolutely using air quality as the lever to get proper ventilation in our workplaces and in, in our spaces. So thank you very much for the speakers. They've done a fantastic job, I think, of raising all those issues. There'll be, the presentations will be sent out to you and with all those suggestions. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, and I think probably it's appropriate, you know, that uh, we continue as, as in the hazards campaign, we say we remember our dead and there's been a lot of people who've died because of COVID but we will fight and we will fight for the living. So we'll continue to fight to protect our members and workers. So thank you very much for joining us.